Welcome everyone to another Discord live stream. Today I'm super excited to have Samia Kalab and Mirella Tomcheva presenting the behind the scenes of Katir Tayeb. First of all, I want to introduce the team. Hey guys. Hi Goro, thank you for having us. Yeah, super uh, stoked what you guys have planned for us. So uh, without further ado, take it away. Okay, I hope you guys enjoy this. Um, I guess we'll start with uh, giving everyone a little bit about our backgrounds. Um, I am a Lebanese Palestinian artist. I kind of grew up all over the place, uh, Kuwait, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and then moved here to the US when I was 17 to study animation and ended up staying here. Um, then I worked in TV shows, mobile games, and eventually uh, virtual reality apps. That's when I kind of got into Quill, thanks to all of Goro's classes and teachings. Now I'm in love with Quill. And Marilla is one of my bestest friends. So Marilla, I'll take, you can take it away from here. Tell me about yourself. Hey there, you guys. Uh, thanks for coming and, you know, watching this live stream. Thank you, Goro, for putting this together. Uh, my name is Mirella Tancheva, and I am an animator primarily, and I have a 2D animation background, but I have worked in 2D and 3D for TV and games. And currently, I am a storyboard artist. And Sammy and I met on a job together, I think. Uh, I you think were, I interviewed you. Yeah, and I, I remember I was so scared because you were asking like tough questions. And I've never met Marella before that moment. So I was like, oh my God, this is intense. And then yeah. I remember the first day I started, he took me out to lunch and got me soup. And I was like, oh my God. Okay, now I want to be your friend. <laughs> and we've been best friends since. I didn't mean to be scary, but uh, I, I guess no, that was. was I was like, you know your stuff. You, you're asking the good questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is just a clip from one of the supplemental material while I talk a little bit about where the idea of the film came from. Um, I love food and I'm sure a lot of people love food too, but I used to be a super picky eater as a kid and, um, it was just really hard for me to eat anything besides cheese sandwiches. That's all I ate. Um. And my uncle, whom I mentioned in the film, he was the the first one to really like get me to try new things. Just the way how he like mixed food together and just made it fun to eat, and and that also uh, transferred to me getting out of my shell. Um, speaking of which, I am very nervous to do this talk, so I'm sorry if I like stutter or anything, but. I'm still not 100% over my social anxiety, so just letting you guys know. <laughs> um, so yeah, when I first moved to the, to the States, I felt really lonely at first because I wasn't confident of my English, so I wouldn't really try to make friends, and then if people talked to me, I would be really shy. But then um, I realized that we can connect over foods. So whenever I made new friends, we would... Uh, go to their favorite restaurants or try food cooked by them or their families. Um, and one big example is, yeah, Marilla, after like a, me working there for a week or two, she invited me over to her house and she made me the Bulgarian dish called, hopefully I say this correctly, uh, Juvet. Juvet? Yeah, Juvet. Okay. Yeah, Juvet. It's perfect. Gibbich. Um, and it was so, so delicious, which also is in the, the, the film. Um, so if you guys ever get the chance to try it, it's definitely worth it. Um, and yeah, when, when I first pitched this idea, um, I, the first person I thought of was Marilla because not only we had similar experiences from like moving around and like, you know, facing different cultures, but also she's, such a great storyboard artist and combine that with our close friendship. Uh, I feel like that really pushed the film where it's at uh, for the final version. Um, and yeah, I mean, I thank you Marilla for this all the time, but can't imagine how much it helped having you as a board. Yeah. So, but thank you. Speaking of which, we can talk more about the story. Yeah. So uh, as Sammy was pointing out, um, 
I like really connected with Samia's story because um, I also had, you know, moved to the U.S. and at times I just didn't feel quite uh, at home anywhere. And I noticed that sharing food with other people, especially with different cultures, it allowed me to like connect with people and feel at home with them, uh, even if we're just somewhere else far from our own homes. Um, but I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about the story process of Katir Tayyib. Uh, originally, Sammy had a bullet point list of like food memories, all organized in chronological order. And I started out uh, with that and came up with possible scenes and like visual ways to represent the points in the outline. Um, and after a few rounds of boards, however, we started to kind of feel like something just wasn't quite working out. Like we weren't getting a good emotional punch. We weren't quite sure where the film was headed. And um, so we realized that uh, we needed we needed a more of like a dreamy quality to the film and a little bit more lightheartedness, a little bit more happiness. And um, so we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and I asked Samia to, um, to journal a little bit about each of these experiences. And, uh, and then from, then I took these journal entries and we re outlined the film using that. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, so we kind of constructed things like this. And uh, I just wanted to like compliment Samia because this kind of thing takes a lot of trust. And uh, like you're working with someone's emotional like uh, memories, and uh, it could be a very like delicate process. And especially filmmaking can be a very delicate process. And so it, it takes a lot of trust between people to kind of do this and do it um empathetically and appropriately yeah That's when, super cool. um, sorry i just wanted to add about the journaling part i'm, I'm not really a, like a language or journaling person i'm more about like drawing so when first marilla asked me to do this because my way was like okay let's bullet point every memory <laughs> the shortest way i can describe it and get to the point so that journaling um assignments you gave me I, I felt like it really got me out of my comfort zone and just going back deeper into those memories and not just writing about like who I was with and what food I was eating but more about like how I felt like what smells I smelled the the colors in the room the textures um that helped me relive those memory on like a deeper level and I highly recommend it for anyone who's into this you know, want to relive things like go for it. It's, you call it free, free writing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was, I, I gave her like paragraphs and paragraphs, yeah. of, like just my like pure like thoughts. And I was like, I'm sorry, this is a mess, but this is what you asked for. Make <laughs> it look good. Yeah, no, no, it's great because you, after you did that, you were actually able to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like can, do the drawings even better because you're kind of recalling these memories and specifically remembering what exactly uh, made you feel uh, the way you felt at that moment. And that in turn can make the art really good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, I want to just go over really quick. Um, like these are the early boards and a lot of these things just didn't make it into the film. Uh, so at the top left uh, corner, we had um, a little boba shop and we had like a little a texting session we were thinking about how like you're communicating with friends and meeting up with them we had um uh, also some indoor and outdoor marketplaces to show uh like the viewers what sammy's childhood could have been like uh but yeah it's interesting to see uh like all of these like little little things and it's also really important to show that none of these made it into the film but they were really integral to the film we have now mm. So, um, so we had to rework the script quite a bit, and this is a uh, Sammy can attest to this. We did a lot, a lot of hours in there. Um, it was intense, mentally. Yeah, it was intense. Mentally. <laughs> and Mirella, um, just a question: you you didn't have VR experience, right? Like when you did the no. storyboards? Yeah. No, no, uh, that was a very interesting process because I had to. Uh, I, I was taking a lot of storyboard classes and I have knowledge in storyboarding, but getting to VR was entirely different. And actually, I wanted to thank you, Goro, because you uh, made some videos about storyboarding in VR that like really introduced the audience to how to think about it differently. And mm -hmm. um, actually having a 2D background and 2D animation background, it really helped with 
understanding that it's a whole different field and you have to think about it differently than you would. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a very different medium for sure. Yeah. You can't just force, force one medium onto another. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so one of the biggest challenges we had, uh, one of the biggest changes we made to the script was, uh, we made it from like a go at your own pace kind of film uh, where you kind of look around and it's a, you know, a self-paced film and we changed it to a traditionally paced film, but we still wanted to give flexibility to viewers uh, and still take them on a ride of seeing this film. Uh, and so this is also another little gift that I made of my boards. Uh, and it's, it's also something that got cut and I wanted to show you guys that some stuff survived to the final film. And uh, a lot of times this pre-production process can be really grueling because you're going through lots of stuff and you're cutting a lot and you're like, oh, why did I, that was just a waste of time. Sometimes it's not. Um, as you can see, some strawberries made it into the film. Spinach triangles, <laughs> triangles made it into the film, uh, just not in this order. Uh, okay, and so due to like time constraints and we had some optimization issues, which hopefully Timmy will talk about a little bit later, and like other factors, we had to make the story a lot cleaner. Uh, we didn't want it to be a list, like we said before, we wanted it to feel like more connected story-wise. So we introduced elements like having Sammy assist or guide us emotionally and physically through the film. Mm -hmm. And we started uh, with Sammy's uncle and ended with Sammy's uncle, which is like the bookend. This is the most important theme in her film. And um, yeah, and then also we wanted to bring in more magical elements. And towards the end, we like really changed up a few, uh, some things and, uh, you know, introduced lots of really fun little stuff. And here um, you can see these are just the thumbnail passes uh, about maybe a third or fourth pass of the film after we so write these. <laughs> yeah, just so many of these. Uh, these were after the rewrites even. And uh, hopefully you can maybe see my cursor, but you can kind yeah. of see the film. Uh, and, uh, and then you'll see some scenes that are just uh, never show up in the final film, and that's totally okay. And here you can kind of see me working out the process and asking Sammy in visual form what she wants. And here's just like different variations of what we could possibly do for her uncle scene. And uh, yeah, and then these like little square formats where Sammy told me how to like look and like draw the back as well as the front and the side. And that was really cool. So I tried mm -hmm. doing that and um, yeah. Kind of like VR, but like flattened out. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Thank you for showing me. And on that note, we go to some art. Oh, script. I actually um, wanted to mention something about storyboarding, but I forgot. Turn it. Uh, I guess it'll, it'll come back later. <laughs> uh, let me just open that screen so I can look at it. Yeah. So the the thing the other thing that was going alongside storyboarding is color script um and i wanted to do that traditionally first or not traditionally but i guess like 2d before i jump into uh quill because i really love color and i love painting um and i thought it would be a good um challenge for me to try to to lay it all out like this before i jump into quill and one of the main things that oh i remember what i was gonna say about the storyboards which actually relates to this um originally when we started storyboarding this film everything was like set in reality um which you can see in that color script this is like kind of the the, the drawings are from the older boards where um everything that was happening you were actually at a table and um the background would, would feel real but then slowly as the storyboards were shifting into more uh, fantasy uh dream like which makes sense because these are all supposed to be like you experiencing my memories but you are me or as like the main character so it would make more sense that some things are missing um or it's your emotional perspective right yeah, yeah. um yeah. it's not like logical or it doesn't have to be all making sense it's more about like the feeling of you being in that space um so that's where the color inspiration also came from. I wanted softer colors. Um, I, don't, I don't know if like if you guys dreams or remember dreams, but usually dreams have very specific color themes to them where it doesn't feel real, but 
it makes sense in, when you're in that space. So I'm hoping this this gave away that feeling um, when you guys watch it. But uh, yeah, so the oh the other thing to note about these is they're not based on the actual shots because I also wanted to explore as many um, colors as I I want in these before I go into cool and kind of pick and choose what I eventually uh, land on. Um, yeah, these were so beautiful. I was seeing some of these while I was boarding and it was just staggering. Like I, and they were so inspirational too, because I, I was sometimes like kind of guessing about what things would look like. And then I would see your, your uh, color scripts and be like, oh, wow, that inspires me to do something else. And so I would go back and change it. So there was a lot of like cross pollination. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I did use your boards to do a few of them. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys see, but the last one before my uncle. Yeah, that one. This is actually just Morella's drawings and I painted over it. I was like, this is perfect. Doesn't need any change. Just me paint over it quickly. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, you know, like I can see each scene. Like it's pretty much almost one to one, right? Color wise. Like it's really cool to see this. Yeah, yeah awesome. some of them kind of the color shifted because the scenes changed later on, like right. from realistic to more dreamy, like in Quill. Cool. But that's one of the things is like, I didn't feel like I needed to go back to my script. Once I jumped into Quill, I just continued editing the color over there. It was kind of like flowy. Um, I didn't feel like I needed to go back. But this as a start was really helpful. And speaking of where I got these colors, um, I actually stole them from this uh, Instagram. From so basically, this Instagram takes screenshots from amazing films and directors, and I just love looking at it for inspiration. There's the link, I highly recommend it if you're like ever stuck or don't know what color palette to choose. Uh, most likely, these people know what they're doing, so whatever color you choose from this will end up looking pretty. So, this was the first first pass on the color. Uh, script where I just screen grabbed some of the ones that like stuck out to me and I kind of wrote down next to it is like oh this could work um like the one on the right is like for the uh Paris scene I had a few of them but then I end up kind of mixing and matching at the beginning and then doing my own take but it definitely helps to have a starting point um because as a lot of people know color is difficult and overwhelming uh to start with yeah, this like I I am not a painter or anything like this, so I would definitely struggle. So when I saw these at first, I was like, oh wow, I didn't know there were even like resources for artists like this. Uh, so yeah, the more yeah, you know, and then know. you can also just if you want to make your own screen grab, and there's like a lot of websites where it makes some um, like a color script for you, like the thumbnails. Yeah, so definitely work smarter, not harder. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's easy, but trust me, it's like it's already challenging making a whole film. It is. People. So if you can use things to your advantage, go for it. No shame. Uh, oh, and then oh yeah, and then well, I can start talking about like the character constructions and the the style of the film. So the first thing I was like, this can't change. Was just how I transitioned my. 2D traditional like drawing sketching style into Quill. I wanted to stay as honest to it as possible um, while at the same using like the the tools and like that Quill has to help push it into like animatable style. Um, so on the left side was like uh, my color script. And you can see that's my dad in the kitchen in Kuwait flipping uh, French toast for us. Um, and the the right side is the quill one. I can uh, we'll go later in quill and I like deconstruct it, but it's just like a, just to see how it works. Um, but the the first thing that I needed to do was that my sketchy style has a lot of lines and. Every time I would do something, it would always go like over budget. Even after I optimized it, it was just like not uploadable to Quest. So it was <laughs> mentally uh, challenging to the point where I stopped thinking creatively and I was like 100% logical. Every time I put a stroke, I'm look, I'm look, I look at the counter, I'm like, darn, another show. <laughs> another show. It was, I, I'm not going to lie, the first month I was at like, um, I don't 
call it the creative block, but I was so obsessed with keeping the numbers down that I was limiting myself and like feeling anxious every time I opened like quilt to work on my film. And I'm like, oh my God, now I'm going to add more strokes. I don't even know it's going to fit because the film is like now at like eight minutes, nine minutes. Um, <laughs> and then I had a chat with Goro about this because I was really, really panicking. Um, and he told me something that I, like really clicked was like, just do your thing and then take it, take things away instead of trying to add it later. And for some reason that was like, like a, like a relief, like a moment of like, oh, I can do that. Even though I knew I could do that, but for some reason I, and I was working backwards. I was like super stressed out about this. And then when he told me this, I was like, yeah, I can do that. Okay, fine. And then I just like, it was like smooth sailing after that. I was just like sketching. And then I noticed, um, even though I was kind of like going more creative than logical, because I was so focused on the logical part early on, that was still in the back of my head, but not in a stressful way. It was more like just keeping you in check, but no worries. Like, I, I don't know if this is making sense now. I'm like, yeah, it's like, super important that, um, you know, your style is not, uh, you know, uh, defined by the tool. And I yeah. think you were like going into that direction. And that's why, you know, like you just needed a redirect that you define the style first and you figure out how to make it work after. Right. So separating those two, I went through that as well. You know, when I was working on Last Oasis, I was like, oh, how do I like keep I did the same thing, you know, like uh, how do I keep the poly count low? But then, you know, you lose all the creativity there because mm -hmm. you're you're becoming a slave to the tool. Right. Yeah. Um, so I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to design it the way I want. And then I figure out how to create it in a more efficient manner. And I think, you know, you didn't sacrifice the style you have on the left side at all. You know, like it's like amazing how one to one it looks, you know, so, so really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad. It, yeah, it worked out. And then um, speaking of just like that work process, like the, the longest that took the longest thing on this film or the most difficult was the scripting and like yeah. just looking at the, the timeline of doing the project. Scripted story was like the biggest percentage. And then the next one was just the optimization of me, like just thinking how to do it. And then the, once I got everything down, producing the film was super quick. Mm. Um, it was like the easiest part, part like once I got <laughs> cool, I started doing everything. So I guess that just, I guess goes to prove that it doesn't matter what the tool is. Like the, the challenge is more about like getting a good story. Um, well, also learning the tool. That's also that. Yeah. Um, and then can we go to the next one? Uh, this is my great uncle in Italy. Uh, I visited him a few years ago and um, that was like the third time I see him in my life because he lives there he never travels so it's very rare for me to see him but um i remember looking at his hands by the way he's 95 he walks every day and his diet is coffee and bread i'm not lying but he said <laughs> that's the the true way to live a long healthy life and he still um, smokes too and he smokes yeah he actually says he <laughs> smokes in a bread like that sometimes he drinks juice sometimes um wow. but i remember like whenever we like would sit at the table and you know i would finish like looking around and stuff around me I, I would just like stare at his hands they just had so much character and not in a creepy way i like drawing old people hands they're just so interesting <laughs> um and then some of them you can tell like what jobs they used to make and, or do that also adds another level um so yeah i was drawing all his hands and and i wanted that when I made him in Quill is to keep that character going with his hands, but you know, also as well, not going over like the memory budget. Um, so you can see in the, in the GIF that it works from different specific views, but once you go like past it, I don't know if I showed it, but I can definitely show you that that's when, when it breaks. So that was the challenge of, you know, uh, making this two and a half, the style um we also stay consistent that also goes from the same for for the faces as well mm. um yeah and then the next one please and then the other thing that 
uh, I attempted is creating 2D animations outside of Quill and then moving them into Quill and combining them with the Quill strokes. Uh, so the, the pizza was one of them. And I painted these in, in Photoshop. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I painted the, the, those pizza pieces in, in Photoshop. I knew where I was like going with the timing. So it's, it wasn't really that complicated. And then I put all these PNGs in Quill, organized them, and then added full strokes in a way where it also matches as if I was, you know, drawing this on, on paper. Um, and, and I think definitely the shape of the brushes in Quill helped me with, with the style as well. Cause I mean, you can definitely work, make like clean work with it, but they're also flexible enough that if I do like the sketchy style, they would actually feel like pencil strokes or brush mm. strokes. Um, and yeah, these two pizzas, the one on the right is, was from Italy and the one on the left was, um, from New Haven, Connecticut. If you guys are ever in there, there's a really good, um, also Italian. <laughs> place but he he started it from 1920 i think or something so they're both italian pizzas they're both good but sammy which one's better ah uh, i i um it's really difficult <laughs> this is it's the most important decision of your life pick now <laughs> I, I, okay i'll say the one in milano milano just because i was having it with my uncle the one in connecticut i ate it by myself so the oh, other one was more i don't know had more flavor <laughs> cool and then, um, yeah, this is another example of foods in Quill. And um, one thing that I, I did just in general for all the foods is that the, the bulk majority or shape of the food I would paint uh, in Photoshop. And then I would take that into Quill and 3D model on top of it or draw, which I will show you right now in Quill. So let awesome. me do that. Jared. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say it was really cool watching her like concepts and while I was doing the whole process, uh, it really inspired me as well. So, so Marina, at what point did you see the VR version actually? Uh, it was uh, right when I finished the storyboards was the very, very last oh. pass. Sammy has started doing a VR pass. Um, yeah where it was just like little uh, like blocks and uh, yeah. kind of moving around. Uh, so that was the very first time. And then I started seeing snippets a little bit right after that. It, and it went from um, like the blocks to suddenly like little bits and pieces. And it like went from like 10% to, to 80%. Or at least it felt like wow. that to me. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. It was definitely helpful having Marilla see my like the the boards in VR because like um, Marilla concepted the transitions in 2D mm -hmm. and a lot of them we actually weren't sure if they were gonna work in VR or not because yeah. you only um, know when you try it. <laughs> yeah, and then like like we know these things like these transitions work hundred percent when it's like a film or a flat um screen and Marilla can speak more about this. Is that for directing the viewer's attention, but in VR, we um, we're just not. We're like, ah, oh, okay. Let's hope this works. If not, we need to have like backup transitions because we didn't want to also like duplicate or reuse transitions. We wanted to have each right. transition between each to be unique, um, right? Yeah, yeah, it was like one of the things that we wanted to do to like push ourselves. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was uh, it was really tricky to, to like direct the eye, and I think that's where having a two D background or just a multidisciplinary background really works, because yep. you you have to think about it outside of the box. Totally. Um, and uh, like I had these really really flat two D transitions, and I was thinking it could work as long as we just redirect the eye correctly, hmm. um, and that's very very important in VR. For from I mean, you guys can uh, talk a bit about more with that. Um, so yeah, that was uh, it was it was kind of a touch and go trust process. Being like, all right, well, let's just test it. We do have backups. Um, yeah. we don't want to repeat ourselves, and we'll, we'll just have to you know fly by the seat of our pants sometimes. Totally. I mean, the trickiest thing about VR is that you cannot assume where people look, right? So you have to make yeah. sure you guide the audience as best as possible, so you can be ninety percent sure that they will look at the right thing. While in two D, you can just frame it, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's always like that challenge in VR that you know the audience becomes the camera. 
And Gilgamesh yeah. is saying um, he's inspired to order pizza tonight, Samia. <laughs> Mm. So we can go over a transition since we're talking about that first, and then I'll, I can go back to like deconstructing the artwork. Is that okay, Marilla? Sure. Okay. So one of like the my favorite transition. If I'm gonna play it this way, actually, let me put myself in the right position to make sure it looks. Yeah. It's me. Oh yeah, and that's Marilla. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I love this transition. This is so good. smoke so yeah. the, the boards for this one also please give me a heads up goran merle if i'm moving my head too much i'm gonna try not to move yeah i'm gonna scream <laughs> <laughs> not, not that okay sure um these are merle's boards um Marilla, the original uh, the old ones right yeah so these on the left side uh, are the old boards where we had you kind of just sitting at my table and this is literally my kitchen this is literally my table this is literally me kind of cooking in front of samia and uh, we were kind of thinking that it was just a little bit too flat and kind of every, everything was just kind of the same and so we wanted to induce like an, a magical element in here and that would could possibly help us with um the transition so I was looking at like my little, uh, the Bulgarian pots, which is called Givetch or Givetchets. And uh, you kind of, I was kind of just looking around them and they're really bright, colorful. And I thought that maybe if I just take the whole scene and put it on the pot, it might create this like really pretty visual thing of like when you open the pot, um, you get this like plume of smoke or That's a vapor. So cool. uh, and kind of the... This is something that was kind of interesting, but thinking about the food in terms of artwork and how they how the food itself tells its own story. So the beauty about these like little pots is that everything is cooked inside of them. So you kind of pile them up and you stick them in the oven and uh, you don't really know what's going to happen. And, and right when you open them up, it's the whole thing's kind of revealed to you. Mm. So this is essentially is a transition that's a reveal. Um, so. Yeah, that was a really cool thing. And we did this very last minute, Sammy. It was like one of the last scenes to get changed, yeah. period. Because we were like the last minute, they're like, oh my God, I don't know if this is going to work or not. So one of the things that we were, I, I was having a hard time in Cole when, when we first started doing this is that if you're not sitting in the right spot where the transition happens, where I'm going to show you right now, it's going to break the whole thing. But yeah. I basically needed your head to be inside of this because if you're like slightly like more forward, you're going to be in the food. And then if you're slightly more back, you're, you're just going to. Right. Yeah. Um, same when, when it also transitions to the, the one that's like in Italy, I also hoping no one broke the, you know, the, this, but one of the things is like, yeah, if, so if you go inside the stroke, it kind of disappears. So I, lots of testing. And it finally, hopefully, landed on the right spots. But if you want to see the transition from the outside, it's, it kind of goes in where your head. We assume that your head is is would be. Um, yeah, one thing that uh, Studio Cyro does, Dan does, is like the um, he in the frame where everything becomes invisible, basically, right, opaque. There's a cube around you, but so basically he puts a big cube around your head right so that way you can you can make ensure that you can see stuff but the problem is if you have like your approach is more like a little bit miniature right so you can't make the cube as big so that's not like really solving the solution but that's something you could consider for future experiences that you can also put the head in a box right for a split second and then yeah and then remove the box again. So that's like a really cool transition trick. But it, it works less for miniature stuff because a miniature, right? If you move your head like 10, yeah, like you're two like, inches, you're already in the, you know, inside the experience, so. And then there's another transition that was also fun to work on. It's the, the one from Italy to, to New York. So these are... The you know, Mirella, your boards look like left eye, right eye. It's almost like a <laughs> stereo board. <laughs> Yeah. But it's not, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, Samuel pointed that out later. And I think I was just trying to conserve space on my page. Oh, that's uh, funny. Literal, like literal. And then later I realized it was like left and right eye. And um, <laughs> that, was a, that was a strange little Yeah, accident. for a split second I thought, like, did you board in stereo? <laughs> like, who does that? <laughs> <laughs> it's the future. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's awesome. Yeah, there's like a transition here where we wanted the pigeons to cover the screen completely. And I and I um, kind of flattened out the pigeons and we just weren't quite like uh, sure how this would run. Uh, I was really scared of this transition, actually. Hmm. Um, so let me play it when yeah, be here. So this is what you're supposed to see. Hopefully it kind of leads back. Oh, yeah. So if yeah. I go frame works frame. so well. So the pigeon actually starts flat flying from there. And then they come. Yeah. This is where the switch is. But you're like so focused on the movement that you don't even catch it. Unless yeah. you're actually looking for it. I'm sure there's a few artists who are like, wait, hold on, I saw it. But can can you actually here. zoom out and show the transition? Yeah. So, so zoom it, out a little bit. Mm. So this is from this. Mm. So there's no like. So clean. simple. Yeah, it's um, and then don't even go through the wall. But again, hopefully, because <laughs> you're just like, oh my god, a new scene. So this is another thing where it's like, you can still direct the viewer's eye, but you just have to be very intentional. And then everything that happens around it, most people won't know this unless you know you're going frame by frame and look for it. Wow. Yeah, you're also using um, the fact that this is a movie and so it's going at a certain frame rate. So the fact that you cut really quickly and it passes by in front of you, it's like manipulating how you see. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, super cool. Uh, Thanks for uh, adding the pizza rat. The pizza rat was lost. <laughs> yeah, he, we had him originally in there and I really wanted the pizza rat. Uh, and then we cut him out and... Ella was sad. I was like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's needed for the back. story. And he came back. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even know he came back until I saw him in. <laughs> originally, we were going to use Pizza Rat to, like, come at the end of the scene. And we wanted the people to, like, turn around and follow him and enter yeah. the, the subway. But then we re realized this was the only scene where we forced the viewers to turn 360. Yeah. And it was just... It was going to be like weird and we actually thought it was not going to work because everyone who watches this is like always focused on being looking at, you know, a table like area and doing this was going to take them out from the rhythm that we I think with. also because in the beginning you say, please be seated, you know, like um, anything that's behind you might become difficult. So I think it was the right decision to keep everything in the 180, right? Yeah. So he actually leaves like pretty quickly, disappears, gone. Um, Goodbye, pizza rat. <laughs> and then this was another transition that was also super fun to work on. Sorry, that's... Yeah. So good. So good. That also, like, we needed to make sure that people are not in there because, yeah, you can see everything disappears. But as long as you're not in the right position, it works. I think another thing that I feel like made these transitions successful, I hope, is that they were part of the story. They weren't just, you know, random transition. It was more like, oh, it's raining. So um, Kayla, my friend, pulls out an umbrella. So in your head, it makes, I guess it makes sense. Yeah. I'm not sure how to describe this. Uh, if Marilla or Gorafi you know what I'm trying to explain here. Yeah, no, no, it's in context, right? So it, yeah. like you never question it as a gimmick or something. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a little bit of anticipation. So you see her kind of pulling out the umbrella, opening it. And so you almost know what's going to happen, but you don't know that it's going to cut. And I think that's really cute about this scene. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I think, yeah, let's move on to the deconstruction of stuff, because I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Um, you are at um, 40 minutes in so far. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, let's, let's go on this so we have time for it. Oh, questions. Um, so the scene with my dad, um, so you're usually seated over here, so you don't really get up close, but we're going to get up close. So this <laughs> is actually just a PNG. You can see. It's not even painful. But, and his head is a PNG, it's not even a full head. But combining that with full strokes that I built somewhat uh, dimensionally. <laughs> so cool. It, yeah, you can see it. This is the front. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> I like but, the side view. The side view looks amazing. Yeah. Oh, this one? No, from the side, yeah, from the profile. <laughs> yeah. So 
as long as you're like seated where I want you to sit, even if you tilt a little bit, it still works. But this was like one of the, the fun challenges because originally when I worked with my sketchy style, I would sketch everything out. So it would still have volume to it. But since I needed to optimize things, I needed to. And I also wanted to have like the watercolor um, like texture in there, which this is my first time trying out. Um, it was, this is actually the perfect example for me, you know, that you're not slave to the tool, that you're brute forcing your style into the tool, right? So it's really like you're, you're making it work to what you what your style is. And, you know, you don't you don't give a damn of what it looks like from the side as long as it looks good from the angle you're supposed to look at it. It's really, really cool. So Question cool. about those um, brushes. Um, are those like real scans of watercolors or is it... Um, um, no, they're actually like alive activated or from um, the guy who makes brushes for Photoshop. So mm, it's okay. file brushes, I think. Mm -hmm. So when you paint, they actually react as if you're painting on uh, paper. So it's not stampy. Um, That's cool. So I, I actually had to paint it a couple times to make it look the correct color. Uh, definitely easier than doing this traditionally because that would have taken way longer. Um, so yeah, you can notice that the the characters and your table always had a watercolor texture on it, as well as as the food. But for the backgrounds, I kept it minimal because again, I wanted the focus to be here and the backgrounds as just like a feeling that you get, not necessarily like oh, pay attention to this. Um, there was. Oh yeah, this is another one where this this guy was pure PNG except for this. Yeah, so you can see here where the I only added the cool. I, I feel like the combination so of cool. um cool really helped push my style to like fit in here. Like they kind of supported each other. That's so awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sammy, how, how did you, um, I wanted to ask, how did you choose what was going to be flat 2D and, and what was going to be in Quill? Because that was a really interesting thing for me to see. Um, um, at first, I wanted the, every scene to feel like complete. I know this is kind of vague to say, but to explain, but like when you look at a scene, there's like a balance between Quill and um like the the watercolor and then one of the things actually from talking to goro and getting his feedback was like oh having like a watercolor on every table so that definitely pushed this to be more consistent so like everything has a watercolor texture on it oh to like unify it yeah across the board yeah well, whether it was like an actual table or, or like you know like see even the stairs have watercolor on them um yeah that was the first thing. And then the other thing is like the foods when I was constructing them, um, they would also be a combination of definitely watercolor and then strokes around it. So actually I can show you this one. So originally this is the PNG, <laughs> which just finished. And then I added this in the back just to give it a little bit more fill. I could have painted it, but I wanted to add full strokes to make it more 3D. And then hmm. when adding these strokes, they are somewhat dimensional, not 100%. Mm -hmm. Because if I push it too much, then it won't fit the style. Like, it will just break. But when you look at it from this direction, it looks like it's dimensional. And then you look at here. You know, it's actually, there's nothing here. But it's like an eye trick. Same with the chicken feet. Uh, let me remove all the cool stuff so you can see. So this is the PNG. Ah, wow, that's so interesting. So this, I could have just put this, and this could have worked, but adding the watercolor to it just feels like it adds so much um, to the texture. And I wasn't necessarily adding like stro like full strokes everywhere, just in some areas to like push it 3D. Um, similar with these. So like even this was like fully. I didn't even have a PNG on it. Needs to find yeah, I remember that it was like a little, a little bit of a balancing act uh, towards the end when we were kind of reviewing scenes together. 
and we were looking at the food specifically and um we were trying to like be really careful about um what looked dimensional what looked too flat and i remember uh, yeah it was a real process and there was a little bit of back and forth uh was it like tricky for you to kind of get that balance um in the beginning yeah because i was trying to figure out like how far should i go with pngs before i put them in quill and do quill strokes it's kind of like the opposite where i was working i think i was doing way more um visual development outside of quill but then I realized that I could totally use this to my advantage. Um, originally, this whole thing besides the egg was actually 2D. But then I realized making the rice in Quill makes this look even better instead of a flat mm -hmm. image. Like, you can see here, I kind of erased quickly. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> That's that. funny. <laughs> wow. Um, I love the rice balls from the side. What, sorry? Oh, yeah. Here's the side, yeah. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you really did a good job in terms of like, you know, melting those two two elements together because like when you take it away, it's funny what's left over as PNG, you know, you would never expect to see yeah. what you see. It's really cool. Um but like other food elements was like hundred percent PNG like this one. And mm. it didn't really matter because it wasn't like what I wanted you to focus on. I wanted you to look here. And it felt like the ones where I combined PNG and Quill was the more attention grabber because it had more details. But this is on the side, and if you look at it, it has like a few Quill strokes, but only oh, to okay. emphasize like my sketchy style, but not necessarily to add to the volume. Yeah. Yeah. And then I had other things where it was fully Quill, so it'd be like this, but then mm. I added these strokes on the side too. If you look at it from here, it looks yeah. like sketchy. Nice. It's funny, it's almost the, the opposite of what they used to do, uh, the old Tom and Jerry episodes, where the, you know that the flat colors are what's going to be animated, the yeah. detail is where what's not going to move. And I always used to look for those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. <laughs> when you know it's going to move, you're like, I know that. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, you're trying to trick me, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm doing it on purpose. It's like, I want you to know this is going to move, not hiding it. <laughs> Similar with these, like, um, if you look at it, hopefully it looks coherent, but if I take out the quill, not the table, it's just this PNG. Oh, wow. And everything is actually <laughs> quill. But because you are sitting here and you're seeing it from this view, you can't really tell you're like, is this quill or is it watercolor? Unless you really stare at, at it, but it's a moving, so it doesn't matter. Similar with these. Super cool. So this was the, the two things. <laughs> I think this one too has a lot. Oh yeah, this was the... So do you know how many PNGs you use, the amount, the oh, number? I have no idea. It's a lot, a okay. lot. Is there a way to find out or I have to actually... If you have them all on a desktop in a folder, probably, but... um. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'll, I'll count them later. Yeah, but... and you should put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it's like over a hundred or... I, yeah, probably because I have like PNG, like actually here, if, let me remove all the cool stuff and then you can, see. these are also PNGs, one, two here, it's rotating soft slowly, hmm. and then there's a PNG, and if I remove this, so this is all the PNGs in this <laughs> That's so cool. Time. Yeah. And Magic. Then, so it still looks fine with Quill, but I wanted my style to be in there. So put PNGs in there. It's a beautiful fusion of styles, I love it. Thank you. Um, and then, oh yeah, this is also another good example of mixing PNGs and people is that I drew this originally and then, and then it looked good, but then adding some like 3D elements definitely helped. Yeah, this is it. especially when you're in VR, right? Like, because right now when you're showing it, it looks almost the same when you take it away, you know, <laughs> but in yeah. VR, you, you really see the volume right so I, I was thinking of those do you guys know these like um greeting cards where it's like a pop-up like cut out pop-up oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You remove the cutout there is a drawing underneath it but there's also the like the, the yeah, cutout yeah. so that like felt like it was adding yeah like this one i actually forgot this was cool <laughs> that's cool <laughs> um yeah i think this is pretty much it for the construction. I, I guess I can talk quickly about the backgrounds. They're also very similar where they're all flat, 
and a combination of like this is PNG, PNG, and then the rest is just like cool strokes. Again, cool was perfect for this because I can like do the sketchiness and then from far away it looks like it blends together. Yeah. Similar here. I really love like in every shot, like especially in this one too, how you know the the people in the background, you know, they're not <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> they're not um they're not um proportional in scale, but you just get the idea, right? Because it's always the emotional perspective. So you Yeah, know, it's like a dream. Like they're there, but you don't really need to worry about if they're human or not. They're yeah. just like souls over there. Yeah, Can we see one, Kayla again from the side? Yes. Yeah, this one because I was again trying to be very like wow. conscious of like what strokes I'm putting. So she does go into a lot of weird phases. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Yeah. But you don't need it because from this side where I wow. put you, she looks volumetric and that works. Yeah, so up close. Cool. <laughs> It's like those drawings on the uh, sidewalk, right? The one that yeah. look, look oh, perfect yeah. from one angle, you know, and then... We get close. Yeah. I'm trying to remember if there was one that was creepy. Oh, actually, this one was... This is uh, our friend Tatiana. So you're sitting here, so you see it. But then if you turn... <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. So it's like you we'll turn to the other side. Wow. Um, this is so cool. Actually, this one too. Like from the side, that everything just because I am basically drawing this character for the viewer, not necessarily to be a three D model. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. I don't. Uh, I can't look at the notes, Marla, or uh, also Goro was sometimes like, let me know if we can move on to questions. Yeah, uh, I think we co covered most of everything. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, we can, if you want to unshare your screen um, to be back in the real world. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. So does anyone have questions? There are questions that you would like me to show here before I exit. Oh, yeah, the, that's right. The virtual okay, we, we have a question. Do you work on the audio narration before doing the storyboard? Or was it the other way around? I found the voice work to be very powerful in adding a personal touch to the film. Oh, okay. It's about the, the voice. Oh, Marilyn, you can start if you want while I exit this. Sorry. Uh, sure things. So um, we actually, uh, so the question is, uh, can you repeat the question again, Guru? I, I didn't so, see it. So um, if you guys did the audio narration work before storyboarding, or was it the other way around? No, no, it was the other way around. Uh, we, we changed a lot of um, the, the script uh, that early, and we, we had to use that in order to do the audio work. Uh, and we had a, we kind of, we chose to use Samia or, uh, because uh, we thought it would be most powerful like that, and uh, it was just it was a it was a tricky process actually. This is a lot of why we spent a lot of time on the script um, was because we wanted to, that narration to feel good and truthful and something that she is comfortable in saying. Um, so it was a little a little delicate balance. So um, did you have the? But in the script, while you are storyboarding, did you already have kind of? the monologue in place or like written or was it something um, that built organically? It built time? organically. Oh, that's yeah, really cool. more like of just me typing like, oh, I was feeling this and eating this and seeing this. Mm. And then at some point we didn't want the, the voiceover to like describe what the scene is, but we wanted it to be like an extra layer. Mm. So some of the things, like uh, most of the things I say, it's not necessarily about like what is in the scene, but more about like the story behind that scene um and definitely because this was like a very personal project it was really intense stuff to like i guess be uh that open because i'm usually in my art i usually distance myself this i would say the first project where i was like this is me and now i'm speaking out um yeah, you can really feel it. It's it's really personal. And Omari said before too. Um, he said like, 
Unfortunately, I missed the beginning. I'll watch it later, but I really wanted to say the story moved me a lot and why it was really, really great. So thank you for the short experience. So oh, I think a, a lot of people, I think, feel that as well. Um, <clears throat> and then um, when you had the, at what point did you have the narration? Was it like after the storyboarding or once you had the VR storyboard ready? Like at what point did you start infusing audio recordings um i i guess oh, you started with scratch voices first and scratch scratch recording first but because that kind of determines also the timing of the story right? yeah i i think the the scratch video i did it probably like when you were like not on the final pass but maybe a few passes before the final final mm. yeah I yeah we did change the script multiple wow. times after that so um, pretty late maybe, in the game then huh yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like writing the script was the most challenging things from this project. Just getting so I'm, I'm guessing after you recorded and after you're putting your voice in, you must have had to adjust quite a bit again with timing, right? So the pacing is right and the pauses are right and stuff like that. Yeah, slightly. And then there's the last scene where my uncle says, I mentioned that my uncle always said tayyib whenever we ate food. So that one needed to be timed out mm. um, with the animation. Yeah. yeah, I wanted the the viewer or the people watching it to understand or hopefully get it that the name of the film is or the title of the film is basically a saying he used to say whenever we ate good food. So I needed to time when I say that it comes out of his mouth and then right. like goes down. Um, but for the most part, I I didn't really need to do any like super tight timing because it was more like the scene is happening and then you're listening mm. um, whether there was like pauses or no pauses but it's kind of like I, I feel like even if you didn't watch it with voice you'll still understand what's going on mm. yeah makes like, sense there was a, like a really I don't know if you remember this part Samia but very early on I I pitched the whole thing using my voice and um we t I timed myself actually while I was kind of pitching to you and I was just acting as you and kind of voicing out everything. And that was really helpful because every time we would just time it and see how that worked. And from there, we were able to like, like, oh, we need to cut this line out. It just, we took too long on it. Um, or we need to extend this part. Uh, so yeah, that was just something I just remembered now. Yeah, yeah I actually cool. just remembered that too. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, Gilgamesh is asking if you use any film references. Um, I looked at old videos, old videos of my uncle when he used oh, to like awesome. of us, um, like from 1997. So in what form were the videos? I mean, back then there was no YouTube, no digital. Is it all VHS tapes or? Yeah, my dad basically transferred all the VHS into like a hard drive. No so way. I That's awesome. I haven't looked at these. I don't know even what, if I even watched like some of them, I was like, oh, these are like good memories. So definitely rewatching this. I guess just like as a backstory, my uncle passed away three years ago. So I didn't have him to ask for reference or like acting. But watching these videos and hearing his voice again, um, that definitely helped bring back memory and try to put his character into like the film as himself. That's a good um, actually segue into a question I have in terms of the supplemental content you did. Um, there's this 1997 room, the apartment. Like, um, how how much of that is actually like based on reality, and how much is emotional perspective? So the crazy thing is, I only had one picture for reference, and the picture is the one I put at the end of the film, which is basically like a part of his door and a section of like the TV stand. Oh, and that's wow. it. I had no other reference. So when I went into like that blank scene in cool, I was like, oh my God, I don't remember anything. I thought I did. <laughs> and then I started by putting like the floor and the walls and then adjusting to the yellow color. Cause I remember it was mostly like kind of like warm yellow tones. And the more I added in, the more like, my memory started to reconstruct. And I'm wow, not going to say and accurate, but it's more of like, you know, when you're like remembering like a dream and then you get one part, but then suddenly you remember yeah. another part and then you just keep going and then you have yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was, I think a combination of like true memories of like actual things, but also if, of me, how I felt. Because the last time I was there in that apartment was probably when I was nine years old. 
and wow. never so it was my memories from back then and that picture from like the end so of that's the literally only mm -hmm. one photo and there's no yeah. video footage or anything no no no. i actually picked her out to look really cool that's so awesome yeah this picture so i had this wow. and i was like oh i remember he had a lot of knickknacks and then he had and I remember he had a lot of plants too everywhere. But that's cool. yeah, that's pretty much it. That's, Are you that's, the one? You're the one on the left, right? That's yeah, that's me. That's my sister. Oh, you're the taller one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I always mean, thought the other one was you. <laughs> not anymore. Now she's taller. <laughs> Younger adult. So um, yeah, like there were some really cool details in there. I saw like Street Fighter on the ground and I yeah. saw also the Pez dispensers. Yeah, Did you have those? Them too, yeah. And I would always like check them if there's candy every time I came over. <laughs> Most of the time they were empty, but one time it would be like one left. I'm like, yes, mine. That's so cool. Awesome. Uh, do we have any more questions? No. Let's see. Um, I think that's it. Like Alex is saying, it would be fantastic to see more food recipes, films like this. The style of this film makes cooking look a lot and like a work of art. Thanks for sharing. Oh. Thank you. Thank so you. thank you so much, Mirena and Samia. This was an amazing, amazing session. You know, I enjoyed it a lot. And, um, you know, seeing the behind the scenes is really inspiring. You know, there, there's angles that I haven't seen before. Super cool. And congrats again for an amazing piece of work. Um, and I still have to make the spinach triangles. And yeah, I saw like a bunch of people from the community, like Peter and Roxandra and Nick, uh, they, they made their own triangles. So that was awesome to see. So whenever you make them, make sure to tag Samia on it. Yeah, Marilla, it makes me so happy. That yeah. Actually, people did it because I didn't think people would do it. I'm just like, wow, okay, impressive. Yeah. Super, super cool. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Um, next week, we have Johnny Belmont back. He's going to talk about and do, cover some um, storytelling um, stuff. So I don't know the exact details of it, but Johnny is awesome. So stay tuned for the announcement um, and see you in a week. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, guys.